topic. It's an important topic. I remember studying it many years ago when I was um, an undergrad in, in psychology. So it's, it's interesting to, to kind of see how that research has evolved. And to get people started, just briefly think about what, what motivation means to you. And we'll be talking about this throughout the session today. And you can um, just kind of keep that in the back of, of your mind as we talk today. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Thank you for letting me know. And we checked, um, people said that they could hear my audio. You can do, um, we can use the chat. You can type chat um, throughout the session. If you want to engage your microphone and speak, if you would please raise your hand and then turn on your microphone and then turn it off when you're not speaking, then we won't have the issues with the background sound and things like that. Does anyone have any questions about that? If you do, please raise your hand. Okay, great. The focus of this session is motivating students. And the students on the screen, a lot of smiles in those faces and they, they look very motivated. And the professor is engaged um, using body movement and things to engage with the students. And we want to have those engaging, lively sessions with our students too, because it helps to build um, and sustain their motivation. And I, I know some of you, and I'm happy to be engaging with others of you I haven't met yet. My name is Dr. Yvonne Johnson, and I work in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. And I um, also teach for the College of Health and Human Sciences, and I've taught um, educational technology courses. I'm currently teaching a doctoral level course where the students are preparing their um, a research proposal and, and practicing qualitative research techniques. And to continue that building of community, if you would please type your, um, type your name and um, your department and things in the chat, then, um, or if you want to engage your microphone, that's great. We, ha we have a smaller group, so we can definitely do that today. But please share your name, your department, what you teach, and just a very brief statement of what motivation means to you. Okay, so welcome to um, Kim, Deborah, Kevin. Uh, Deborah, I see you teach English and American literature, and it's yeah, it is kind of cold. Yes, that's true. Seems odd, but it's March, I guess, in the Midwest. And Rami, okay, you teach world languages and cultures, and you're an Indonesian uh, teaching instructor. Okay, awesome. And Kim works in the Department of Communication and you teach public speaking. Perfect, okay. Matt Stark, Nutrition and Dietetics Program Coordinator and you teach um, 498. And that's where the students are exploring their major, okay. Um, and Marcella, you teach KNPE and uh, sport management classes, okay. Kevin, Sociology. And Kevin says motivation is inspiring and interest in the sociological perspective in uh, your students. Great, thank you for sharing that, Kevin, appreciate it. 
And so we have a different backgrounds in, in the participants today, and that always creates a, a strong foundation for discussion and construction of knowledge in these sessions. So that's terrific, and you're all, um, I'm very happy that you'll have joined us today. And we're going to be talking about motivation and we'll talk about instructional strategies and then we'll have a wrap up. That's where we're going in this session. And um, at the end of the workshop, we, you will be able to define the term motivation and explain different theories of motivation and explain how instructional strategies could be used to enhance students' motivation in one of your courses. And clearly this, this is not a deep dive into theoretical perspectives of motivation. We're just going to look at different views on the surface and then how you might address those with your instructional strategies in the classroom. And referring to Cook and Artino's article, their um, perspective is motivation has been defined as the process whereby goal-directed activities are initiated and sustained. So that's, um, much of this material has been adapted from that article. There are many other resources on motivation, um, but this, this particular session does draw uh, quite a bit from that article. And so you're considering um, that there's goal-directed activities and that the, the work on those is initiated and sustained. Um, so we'll talk about how to, how to kind of get at those aspects of the definition. And I wanted to make sure that we touched on the different um, theories of motivation, not, not at a deep level, but considering that motivation, there are different um, perspectives of motivation. And you might wonder why some students are motivated, extremely motivated in some situations, and other students in that exact same situation are not as motivated. And that's why I wanted to bring up these different theories of motivation and just kind of use those as, as guides for us to go through this process. And we'll, we'll touch on them individually um, at a surface level, and, and we can have discussions about how you might address those in, the, in your courses and instructional strategies and how you design your courses. So we want to make sure that people are not stuck on the idea that, you know, a certain person is, is just not motivated. There are many different things that we as instructors and professors can do to create the conditions for students to be motivated in the course. And, and that's what we're going to look at today. In terms of that expectancy, um, perspective, there's, um, you know, each one of us has an expectation of success um, for a particular situation that we're in, and we have a, we have a perceived value of the task. And so the expectancy uh, theory gets at that expectation of success and value of the, of the task. And is there an immediate or future personal gain if the person uh, completes that task, puts a lot of effort in and completes that task? And there's different aspects of the, the learning environment and the students' perspectives that impact and, and determine, um, influence the, the value of the task as they see it. Is that topic interesting or enjoyable to the learner? And if, if they do, um, if they're learning this topic, is it going to help them to master a skill or is it going to help them lead to future goals? What is the value in their future for this? 
And is learning this or mastering the skill something that's personally important to the student that maybe they want to um, have this skill or, or uh, be proficient in this knowledge to affirm their self-concept? You know, maybe they, they really believe that they're a, an outstanding, whatever it is, uh, professional in a certain area. Maybe they, they want to um, believe that their scientific knowledge is way above average. And so they say, okay, you know, there's value in this task because it, if I complete this, it's going to show, yes, I am a brilliant scientist or I, I, um, it affirms what I think about um, myself and my, and my skills and my self-concept. And then they're also thinking about the value of, if I put my time and energy into this task, what else is going to be neglected? And I remember way back when I was um, an undergraduate, many years ago, when I was taking, you know, very, maybe six classes or whatever. And one of the classes had, I mean, to, to uh, you know, get an A in the class required extraordinary efforts that um, really, when I was considering it, like in the workload and the, what it would impact my other um, grades and things, I made a conscious decision to say, okay, I know that I have this much time and, you know, I'm working and I have all these classes and I have family and all this stuff. So I know I have this much time and I'm willing to put in X amount of time for this class that has all of these um, really, really demanding assignments and tests and everything. Because, you know, I'm okay with a B in that class because for me to do all of that extra, put in all that extra effort and everything is going to negatively impact my other five classes. And my other five classes are more important to me than the particular class that was going to require so much. And I didn't want to neglect those other classes. And the topic in the class that required all that extraordinary work was not as valuable to me. It wasn't as interesting to me. So I remember making that conscious decision. And uh, to this day, I, I know that it was the right decision. I, I was um, glad that I made that. And that's the only B I got as an undergrad. And it really related to this particular situation, the value of the task and, and the, um, what it's going to do to your other um, tasks and the impact. And I've included these different models from the article because I want you to have a visual of these models. And in the expectancy model, there are social influences, cognitive influences. And when we look at motivation theories and uh, research, we see that Yes, the social influences impact motivation and these cognitive processes are a factor as well. And, you know, we have, um, we think about past events and attributions to those past events. How did that, um, what were our reactions and how did that go? Um, there's emotional aspects to this and we have motivational beliefs um, goals and self-concept and perceived task dif difficulty impact the value that we are going to assign to a particular task. And if students, if you have an assignment or a big project or there's a very complex topic or module or um, you know month in your course and the students don't see that there's value to that to them. They're not interested in that. They they don't connect it with their future. Then that might be a, a time when there's a challenge in terms of the motivation of students in the course. And so you know there are different things that can impact. Um, and the cost um, expect expectancy for success. And we'll talk later in the session about 
mindsets and how those impact students' motivation. If, if a student is, believes that they have, um, you know, they expect that they would be successful if they decided to complete this task, learn this work, develop these skills, then they're more likely to be motivated say, okay, yeah, I can do this. It's gonna be a lot of work, I can do this. And I expect to be successful. And some of the factors that connect with this expectancy value are choice. You know, we talk about that in classes, engagement, effort, persistence, achievement, and performance. And those types of things we can address in the way that we teach. We could provide choice of topics to study. Um, many courses do allow for us to provide choice. Maybe you provide different books for them to select. Maybe they can um, select a certain theory or something that gives them multiple opportunities to choose from. And then they got to be able to decide what they're, what they're going to learn for this particular assignment and you can still assess those same instructional and learning objectives. It's just that the students had some choice in that, in selecting. And engagement is an aspect if students feel that they are engaged in the process of the teaching and learning processes, then they're going to have um, more likely to have an expectation that they could be successful. And they're, you're teaching them things, they're sharing information, maybe you put them in small groups, maybe you have some kind of engaged online activities, partner activities, but uh, we have some workshops on active learning and, and different instructional techniques. And there are classroom assessment techniques, there are literally probably thousands of them and you can integrate those with your classes, keep the students mentally engaged. You can have them, you know, getting up, or I even do it with my um, online students. I'll have them stand up and um, do different things to keep them engaged. And one of the things we uh, talked about on the prior slide was persistence. And if you have a large project, and it literally will take the students months to complete that project. And, and I have this because I teach research proposal courses. And to keep them engaged and help them to monitor their performance and um, stay motivated, if you break up those large projects into smaller scaffolded projects, then they have multiple opportunities to see how they're doing um, in terms of, you know, the feedback from you, you can give them feedback and then they can, um, they can adjust their work. It helps to regulate the workload. There's not this long time in a course where, where they're not submitting work and then all of a sudden they have this huge project and, and they all submit this huge project. So breaking it into smaller chunks that make sense. And I do that with the research proposal project, break it into the um, part where they're designing it, where they're collecting data, where they're analyzing data and reporting data. And so those chunks make sense, helps them to persist because they feel like they're making progress along this project. And that, that is important to provide their uh, to help them persist. And it also provides multiple opportunities for success. And that's going to help with their expectation of success. If they have, um, I taught a freshman class uh, for the first time last semester, and I'd been teaching masters and doctoral students for years. And I wanted to teach uh, incoming freshmen because I wanted to see, um, you know, how how it would be to teach um, students who hadn't been um, in college as long. And when those assignments, when they have those multiple assignments, it, they can get 
feedback that can help them feel successful. They can say, wow, you know, this research uh, or this project I thought was really going to be hard. And it is hard, but, you know, I've succeeded in this first um, chunk of the project. And so, you know, I, I think I can, um, you know, kind of go at the second aspect of the project and be successful and continue. And then they get another contact with another set of feedback. And so they have multiple opportunities for success. And that's going to help to build that expectation of success for them. And, and we want them to believe that, that they can be successful. And so the way that you structure the assignments and um, uh, that can really help the students uh, progress. And, and it keeps them motivated because they feel like they're gaining the skills that they can really handle these, um, this class and these assignments. Then another theory related to motivation is attribution. And attribution is, it, it looks at after an event, um, the learners, they create the subconscious causal explanation that it's, so they're attributing something uh, that they did to the results. Okay, so what happened? What caused these results? To what do I attribute these results? And when you're looking at the, the visual of that, you know, there's um, something happened. So maybe they had an assignment um, and they had these, they have their experiences and they have their personal environmental conditions that they um, have lived in and it, it impacts the way that they analyze and attribute those causal relationships. And some of the perceived causes might be, maybe it's their ability. Maybe the student thinks, oh, I am just really, really good at, at um, whatever this course is. I'm great at public speaking or I really am good at gymnastics or um, maybe I wasn't as good at it, but I worked really hard, put a lot of effort in and, um, and then I was successful. So, so it worked or maybe it was luck, you know, maybe I um, just got lucky that day or things that also they might perceive as causes could be the difficulty of the, of the class and, uh, or of that task. And if they didn't have that, perceived um, expectation of success, then they might attribute the difficulty of the, of the project or the um, topic to their lack of success or sometimes mood, health, other people, things like that. I, I remember an accounting class that I took a long time ago and one of, this, one of my, my friends, she sat right next to me, it was, she got really, really nervous during tests. And so she would um, like, like really hit her calculator hard and it was really loud. And I, I used to have to really like focus and try to block that out because it, it was distracting to me, but I didn't want that to be a cause for, um, you know, have a negative impact on, on my grade in the class. And, um, but I, but I could, you know, some, some person might say, yes, you know, I just couldn't concentrate because that, um, you know, my friend was, was doing this and, um, but I, I was able to um, overcome that. So that was awesome. And then the um, locus of control, um, if you have control over a situation, then um, you might say, okay, so I had control over this situation and, you know, I put in the effort or I didn't, I was, I wasn't feeling well, I had the flu. And so that's the impact of um, the causal impact of the success or not as successful on the um, outcomes. And so causes um, and the control over a situation can change. Um, it could be stable or it could be unstable. And so if you don't have control and it's unstable, like maybe sometimes the professor gives um, clear directions, sometimes not. 
Sometimes you get the information for the assignment way ahead, sometimes not. And so the student's motivation could wane because they there's instability. And that, that's why we talk about having those rhythms in your courses where students can, can get to where they, ex, they know what to expect. The modules open on a certain day. The lectures are a certain day. The assignments are due at a certain time. And so they feel that even though it's an external, you know, the, the professor controls this, but it's stable. So that impacts their motivation. They say, okay, you know what? I can do this. You know, it's a hard class, but I get the information ahead of time. There's not these curveballs out of, out of the blue. So, um, so that can have a positive impact on, on their motivation. And then control, um, if, they, if they have no control, they might not be motivated because if, if it's, let's say it's an unstable environment and they really have no control over it. And they say, well, you know, I'll try to get to that assignment, but you know, we didn't get it very far ahead of time and I didn't really get that much um, guidance on it. So I might not be as motivated to, motivated to complete it at a high level, not, not necessarily feel like I could be successful because you didn't actually know that much about it and didn't have a lot of time to prep. So that can affect motivation as well. And there's some, um, emotional aspects and you know maybe their their self-esteem um, is impacted their pride are they hopeful about a situation maybe it's a, a really hard class or it's something they have not done before and so they don't know anything about the topic but are they hopeful that they can be successful and if they're hopeful that they can be successful then they, that increase, there's an increase in that expectation for success. And then their motivation is going to be higher than if they say, oh, man, there's no way I can learn this stuff. You know, I, I, just, I just think I'm going to bomb it. And that has a significant impact on their motivation. And um, if, if they don't do well, um, they might have shame or guilt. Um, I was uh, working with somebody the other day and a student um, wrote in and said, you know, I just took this quiz and I just bombed it. And the student said, I had no idea why I was not expecting that at all. And so, you know, it, it, um, it wasn't my student, but I thought about all these motivational um, aspects and how these theories would apply. You know, how did that student prepare? Did they, did she think she could be successful? Um, and apparently she did because she was surprised at her, her low grade on the, the quiz. So then she was trying to search um, and work with the professor to try to figure out what happened. And so she was kind of going through this attribution um, theory. And so choice, um, engagement, um, persistence, we, we kind of talked about that. You're going to see some themes that, that go throughout the different theories. And um, so you'll, you'll see some of the same terms come up as we discuss the different theories. And one of the things, um, social, um, the social environment has an impact on um, what students attribute to their success. And one of the things that you can do is have students help with building a set of norms for the course. You know, they're all, every course has expectations for behavior and uh, students' contributions and all of these things. And you can have students help to build that. Maybe you have some, some aspects of those, the norms for the course that are set. But you can ask students to engage in an activity where they help to build some of those norms for the course. And then they're going to feel that they were part of that social aspect of the course and that they were valued, you know, their perspectives are valued. And that's going to have a positive impact on um, 
what they attribute to their success. They say, okay, well, you know, the social norms are hard. They're kind of strict, but we all helped create them. And so, um, so I, you know, and, and we created them because we thought they were going to help us be successful. And um, so getting that, um, them to be involved in the process um, is, is helpful in building their, and sustaining their motivation. And when students are learning new knowledge, and that if you can help them to connect the new knowledge with prior knowledge, then it can help because they are, um, let's see, I'm looking at this. If you can help the students to connect the new knowledge with prior knowledge, then they can, it helps their motivation because they say, okay, I can build upon this um, knowledge that I already had. And I know this is gonna take me to more complex levels. Um, and so it helps, it helps to build their motivation, helps them to have a positive expectation, see, expectation for success. And can build in activities that help students see the impact of their, of their efforts on their learning outcomes. And what I do with a lot of, um, I have reflective aspects of almost every assignment. And sometimes if, it, I usually do it with an earlier assignment um, that is, is a complex assignment, but I want the students to think about how they approach this assignment and the outcome, and then think about, okay, what, what went well? What do I want to revise for the next time in terms of my effort? And it helps them to be able to see, okay, you know, I put this effort in, I contacted the professor, I went to the, um, now they can get these study buddies on the Navigate system. And so I did all those things and I can attribute the success on that particular assignment to all of these different um, activities that I put in and extra effort that I put in. And so, so I build that, have the students to find out that information from themselves, instead of going to the uh, professor asking, okay, tell me, tell me what I did wrong. And so you'll have to clarify um, content, but if they can go through that process of, you know, what they did and what they could do differently um, to be more successful, then it's powerful because they discovered it within themselves. And, um, help them to also see that, you know, sometimes, you know, everybody has a, a tough time, a bad day, whatever. And so maybe they just bombed an assignment. And, but, but help them to see that one bad grade does not mean they're going to fail the class. And that's why some um, instructors and professors have different options, like maybe a, a pass, for an assignment or a, you know, like a homework pass, or maybe they have dropped the two lowest test grades um, or let the students revise and resubmit, things like that. And it's going to help with motivation in terms of the students know, okay, you know, this one bad grade is not gonna totally wreck my, my grade for the whole course and Maybe I have, depending upon your policy, maybe they have some um, opportunities to resubmit or, or to um, not have that grade counted in their um, final grade for the course. And in terms of the, we talked about attribution and we talked about expectancy um, value. Um, looking at the, At here, let's see. Um, okay, so um, Deborah's talking about um, synchronously, all exams are open book, untimed. Okay, so you have open book and untimed. Okay. Um, yep, and some, well, and you raise a, a point, Deborah, that 
um, you know, you we create these these um, conditions to for success for the students and to help them stay motivated and um, then you know then they they have to have a corresponding um, contribution to that process too. It's it's a two way process and and so if you let them take the test again and they don't take it, well, then they need to, then there would be an attribution, okay. They didn't take it. And so what happened? They got this bad grade. Um, so, so that fits with one of the um, motivation strategies that you know they made this choice and um, then they would be attributing the um, for performance and the, the fact that their bad grade stays in there. Um, really because of an action that they took or decide or didn't take. But in terms of the expect, expectancy theory and the attribution theory, um, what kinds of um, ways do you all approach those to help students to have an expectation of success or help them to um, be able to attribute their effort with their performance, things like that. Let me see, we have people from English and sociology and communications. Does anybody wanna share um, an example or a thought they have about that? Okay, all right, so we will go on to the social cognitive theory. And that one um, has an emphasis, it's, it's a human learning and perform, uh, that human learning and performance result from reciprocal in interactions among personal, behavioral and environmental factors. So, so that, you know, we're learning and our performance, you know, there's this, the connections between our personal, behavioral, and environmental factors. It's not just one thing, it's these multiple um, factors that influence our motivation, a student's motivation in a course or for to be successful on an assignment. And looking at that model for social cognitive theory, there is a pre-task self-efficacy. You know, we, we talk a lot about self-efficacy in higher education in terms of pedagogy and best practices for teaching. And so does the student think that they um, have the skills to be, to complete this task um, successfully? Do they have the past experiences, aptitude and the social support that, that they need? And this is before the task. And so um, are they coming in with this? And there are different, um, different factors that shape their self-efficacy, whether it's maybe it's a mastery of the experience, um, it's credible persuasion, um, there's favorable physiological responses and emotions. And um, for the task engagement factors, now these are the ones that we can impact with our instructional strategies. We can um, increase their engagement, which is going to have a positive impact on their motivation. We can um, explain, clearly explain the purpose of the, of the tasks and um, the difficulty and <clears throat> help them to connect that with their, um, what's important to them and we can give them um, ongoing feedback and strategically provide um, supports and rewards and help them to set goals. And they, you could build in goal setting activities to your course. And then students have, they have a, a they're vested in the process because they contributed, they set the goals or they contributed to the goals um, or set their own goals. 
and then their um, the self-efficacy, whether they think they can um, do the task or not, um, there are impacts before the task, what are they thinking? Um, during the task, how are they performing? Okay, do they, are they still getting the, um, do they still have that perception or perspective that they can be successful, that yes, I have the, the knowledge, skills, ability, attributes, intelligence to be able to complete this task su successfully. And then after the task, they can, um, you know, they go through that attribution process. And um, that students get feedback from the professors. And if, if you're working with a student and trying to um, encourage them in a certain way to take certain actions to um, improve their persistence in the class or motivation, um, the credibility of the person that's trying to persuade the, the student has an impact if they believe that um, the person, the professor or instructor is credible, then they say, you know what, it's going to have a bigger impact on their motivation. They're more likely to do it. And then um, for the instructional strategies, um, the forethought phase, that's the pre phase. And so helping them with goal setting and when you are, we talked a little bit earlier about a large project that you break into smaller projects, um, then you could build in a goal setting um, assignment and then have them strategically plan, say, okay, you know, I have so many weeks to complete this. Okay, I need to backward plan. I need to get a strategy for, um, getting this done successfully. Okay, so I can set these interim goals and you can guide them through this process. And then um, they're, this is before the, the task again, their outcome expectation and their interest and value of the task um, and their goal orientation all impact their, um, the social cognitive motivation that they have. So before there's things that happen before the task or the assignment, and then they're performing, they're in this performance phase and they, um, if they are able to control their, um, their work and their kind of be more self-regulated learners, then um, that will help them move through this uh, process of completing the performance phase of the task. And if they have these goals and the strategic plan that they set up in the, the pre-phase for the assignment, um, and you made those assignments, the goal setting and the strategic planning were assignments, then you're scaffolding them along this process. And you're um, helping them to stay motivated because they're getting this um, they're seeing that they're, um, they're part of the social network and um, their cognitive um, efforts combined with that social um, aspect of the class are, are helping to keep them motivated and to persist through those challenging assignments. And uh, self-control also, you know, time management and um, structuring the environment NIU has, we are very fortunate to have extensive support for supporting students' um, success in the academic support services um, at the, it used to be the Campus Life Building. I don't know what, what it's called now, but a lot of the academic support services have been centralized and you can find those supports online. And I shared a lot of those with my UNIV 101 students in the fall. And it helped them with um, time management, um, setting up their environment for success. I had, I was um, one of my students, I, I took them to the library and we did a tour and we did a scavenger hunt and all this stuff. And one of my students said, Dr. Johnson, I had never um, been to the library before. 
And he said, you know, this environment is really structured to support me. And he goes, and then he said he had been to the library a number of times. So, um, so I felt that was valuable. Um, and he saw other, you know, a social aspect. He saw other students studying in there. And so he said, oh, okay, you know, this is um, a support for me. This is gonna help um, me succeed. And it increased his motivation. He kept going there. He, he said it was a better place to study than his dorm room. So, um, and also the tutoring services, there's academic support in the library as well. And that was another, I helped them to understand those supports available. And so he's studying in the library and he realizes, oh, you know what? I really need some help with my writing or I really need some help with my math. And then the academic support services are available in that same building. And so that um, really helped with that integration of the social cognitive aspects to help him be successful. And he um, really was very successful in the class. So it was really fun to watch his um, skills develop and his understanding of, of college and the processes for, for um, support and success helped him to be, um, to do well, he's doing well. And then um, you can have incentives. And we talked about the, if students are interested in it and they value the task or the assignments. And what, what I always do is I walk students through um, a series of questions to help them to identify um, the value of an assignment, what, what's an incentive, why should they complete this? And um, one of the classes I teach is a qualitative research. And sometimes students don't, um, they don't necessarily have, they don't know what it is or they don't have a value for that knowledge when they come into the class. And so one of the early activities that I do is to explain to them what this qualitative research is and then help them to connect it with why would this be important to them? What's an incentive um, for them to engage in this? And, and they see they're in a social group. They see the other students are saying, oh, you know, this could really help me with this project I'm doing at work or this might really help me with this other class, or maybe I could understand um, this situation that's kind of been perplexing me for a while. And so that's another um, activity where I'm helping them to discover the interest in, um, and the value and incentives in, that are already existing in there. Um, and then self-consequences. Um, if the students can, um, there's another separate seminar on self-regulation. And But if students set up those goals and those tasks, and they also include self-consequences, then that's going to help with that self-control and help them to progress and persist and ultimately succeed in the course. And with the self-observation, metacognition, um, thinking about their thinking and thinking about um, their learning, those can be some very insightful activities. And I use a number of those with students as well. And they begin to see that maybe, maybe studying with um, all of those distractions in a dorm room, maybe that's not supporting their um, learning and success as well. You know, they, they like it because they're around people that they, you know, the students, they're the same age and everything. But after thinking about it and monitoring their performance, they might say, you know what, maybe I should go consider the library. You know, we, we did a chore and the you know, it's quiet and I can focus more on this complex information that I need to understand. 
and building in that self-recording if they, and this, I uh, built this into the UNIV 101 course as well, by having these at the beginning of each class had a um, student share how they, we learned a certain technique last week and how did they use that technique to support their success. And they would say, you know what? I did a time management. Uh, I made a plan. I got a calendar and I made a plan. And so now I'm recording my success. Or, you know, they changed their environment for, for where they study. Or they're making sure they get enough sleep. And they, they record this, just some informal notes. And then they can see patterns. And, and they discover it for themselves. Oh, you know what? So that week, you know, it's really busy. I didn't get enough sleep. I didn't eat, you know, the healthiest food and I didn't do so well on my exams. And then, so maybe the next week they try to get more sleep, they try to get some sunshine, um, make sure that they put effort into their classes. And then they're recording to say, oh, you know, I did a lot better on, uh, on my coursework this week. You know, last week I fell asleep in class, but this week I didn't, you know, I, so maybe it does pay to, eat healthier and, um, but that self-recording helps them to see it for themselves. Um, and so they can cognitively see how that is um, impacting and it can help to motivate them because then when they have that recording, they can see, oh yeah, it does make a difference. And then they see patterns over a period of time. Um, and then um, for that self-reflection, the end, they, get to that um, causal attribution. Um, okay, and so, so they do an evaluation, okay. These are the ac actions I took, this is how they worked. These were my outcomes. Was I satisfied with that? Am I happy? Do I feel like it was worth the effort? Do I feel like it was, the payoff was worth it? Um, and then adapt, okay. So this, this is the way I performed. These are the actions I took. Do I need to revise that? Do I need to adapt it? Or maybe they um, have a defensive um, perspective where it's say, well, you know, that wasn't something that, you know, it wasn't my fault. There's something that, but we want to make sure that you have, um, excuse me, there's somebody that they know that monitoring and self-recording and then adapting is they're continuously um, improving their skills and it keeps their motivation high and they're more likely to be successful. And then the goal orientation theories are related to learners tend to engage in tasks um, with, with concerns about the mastery of the content. Um, they think about doing better than others. Okay, so there's a performance approach or avoiding failure. Um, and the avoiding failure, you, um, you can see this in students. Oh my goodness, you know, I, an F, that's just, that would just be horrible. Um, so I want to do what I can to avoid, avoid that failure. Um, or you have students that are really competitive. Um, and I remember when I was, undergrad uh, graduating and you know we all had those cords and they distinguish your um you know if you graduate at the top of your class or things like that and there was one of the um one of my student friends um well he was a colleague in the same department as me and he was really looking at the cords and and I remember when he saw somebody's um cord and I could see the surprise on his face and it was almost, he was almost aghast that he couldn't believe that that student got a, a higher grade point average than he did. So it was that, that particular student was really um, oriented by, okay, I wanna do better than others. Um, so with this goal orientation, um, intelligence and um, ability is an aspect of it, the mindset. We're gonna talk about growth mindsets and um, fixed mindsets. And there are performance goals and mastery goals and um, the impact 
And we want to make sure that students know that they they can it they can continue to learn and build knowledge and they may know nothing about a topic. They start from where they are and we continue to build them to more advanced levels of knowledge and skills and they can continue this their whole lives. And so we wanna make sure that they understand that, okay, just because I'm not very good at this now, over a period of time, I keep with the stay motivated and, um, you know, follow these um, suggestions and eventually, um, hopefully I'll get better at it. And so um, we want to make sure that they, they don't fixate on, oh, I bombed the test, you know, I'm going to bomb the whole class, I'm going to um, not do well in school and things like that. And for the growth mindset, um, this uh, comes out of Dweck. And uh, characteristics of that are that the focus is on learning and embracing challenges. And there's that comment about uh, growing pains and learning is growth. And, you know, there are challenges involved with that. There are uh, struggles, there's pain, and we have to persist through these challenges and setbacks. And, you know, a scientific um, study can be an example of um, you know, persisting through those situations um, to get success. It wasn't that first study. It wasn't that first try. Um, you know, they had to keep working at it and adjusting the factors and all of that. And I was telling my students the other night that, um, you know, they're very new to this concept and the uh, principles of qualitative research. And, you know, I was telling them, it's like, it's like learning how to walk when you're um, a baby. You know, you try, they try these different things. They're rolling around, they crawl. They try to push themselves up, you know, and eventually they stand up and then they start taking these small steps and, and they're kind of wobbly. And, you know, eventually they're, they might be a ballerina or a gymnast or um, something like that. So it's um, that the growth that we want to, um, help them to understand that they can persist through the setbacks and, and we're here to help them. And NIU has a lot of support. And um, I do share the support systems that NIU has a lot. And the student navigate system, I mentioned it a little bit before, but there's um, a way for them to get study buddies in the um, navigate system. And so even if they don't know anybody in the class, they could still sign up for that study buddy. And if other people sign up, then um, they can um, help to persist through those challenges. And a growth mindset, if, if they believe that, you know, they're seeing effort as their path to mastery and they're learning from the feedback, um, you build those scaffolded assignments into the course. And when you provide feedback, um, what I do is I will provide the feedback and then for the next iteration of the assignment, um, have them show, okay, how did they change this? Um, how did they change what they submitted to address that feedback that I gave them? And because integrating those recommendation is important. You want the students to integrate that feedback and continue to make their work better so that they can see the effort for their um, and the positive outcomes on their path to mastery and that they can learn from that feedback. And finding inspiration in the success of others, there's um, all kinds of ways to do that. There's lots of YouTube videos or just from your friends or people in class can be inspirational to say, okay, this is hard, but I can see that person did it and that person did it. And, they were successful and I can be successful too. And then the, the fixed mindset is um, they, they wanna look smart. They want people to think they're smart, avoid challenges because they, it's um, avoiding the challenge because they might feel like, okay, I don't know how to do this. I might look, I might not look smart when I'm doing this. And so I don't wanna, um, 
I don't want people to see me when I'm when I don't know that at the highest level. And so um, then they might give up easily. Uh, they might not see the point of their effort, things like that. So we want to make sure that we focus on that growth mindset um, and encouraging them through um, the growth mindset and, and let them know that they're going to, to experience challenges. Everybody that learns this or tries this um, skill or, or you know, a, a concert pianist is not that proficient when they first pick up the piano. So let them know that uh, just because they're not good at it now doesn't mean they're not going to get great at it. And then some of the techniques you can use to foster that growth mindset are praise the process. So they're working through this process and, and um, doing these incremental um, types of activities and assignments. So praise that, the process. Don't just wait till the end and, and provide comments and praise on that end result. The process is really important and that helps to keep them motivated. Say, okay, I learned that part. Now this part was kind of hard, so I got to keep working at it. But, you know, Dr. Johnson said, you know, if I do this and this and this, it's going to help. And so, so it's going to help to keep them motivated and have um, realistic expectations um, of the outcomes. And if a student um, doesn't study, okay, all right, thank you. Um, doesn't study, then they, um, you know, what's the realistic um, expectation of the outcome? They might not do as well as um, if they did study. Um, and in your class, create the uh, culture that, that promotes learning and effort. And you're saying, oh, you know, you really worked hard at that. And so just kind of refine this aspect um, and, and build that into the culture of your class and facilitate positive self-talk so that they're encouraging to themselves to, instead of saying, oh, you know what, I really didn't do well in that, um, you know, reframe that and say, okay, okay, I need to focus on how I can do that better next time. And these are the actions I can take. And so I have a goal. I'm going to um, focus on this goal and be more successful because we all know that that negative talk is not, um, is not helpful and it, and it has a negative impact on motivation. And then the self-determination is um, related to intrinsic motivation leads people to act purely uh, to, satisf to satisfy their curiosity or desire for mastery. Um, and all other actions are prompted by extrinsic motivation, which is driven by social values. And so with the self-determination theory, um, there's that you can see at the, there's the regulation we talked about regulation um, a couple of times today, whether there's external um, rewards and punishment or um, internal, um, there's integrated, where, whether it's their values and the um, relatedness, competence, competence, and autonomy, they're um, those are going to be enhanced by uh, respect, having an inclusive environment. We know that it's important to um, have an inclusive environment where, where students believe that they're valued and that their perspectives are, are important and they can hear different perspectives. Um, and then create the con um, conditions for optimal challenge. So we wanna make sure that we're creating challenging assignments but not too challenging so that the students wouldn't be able to be successful. You need to think about the um, level of the challenge depending upon what level of the course that you're teaching and then continue to take them up to the next levels from there. And we talked about autonomy and it's, if you provide choices and explanations and rationale and um, acknowledge their feelings of uh, choice is going to help them. They say, okay, um, I can be autonomous on this. I have these four options. 
I'm going to select this one, the explanation for that. Okay, I understand that it's going to um, meet the course objectives. It relates to my um, long-term goals and um, there's an acknowledgement of feelings. Um, do they feel that, um, that they can be successful? And um, we talked about intrinsic regulation already. The instructional strategies that you can use, and some of these overlap because some of the themes and the theories as we talked about in the beginning, um, some of those themes are interwoven throughout the theories. But goal setting activities can help students with that self-regulation. And then they are progressing through the class site. I see when I provide um, activities that allow students to set goals and, and give them clear explanations and they can regulate themselves and, and they move through the course in a smoother way. And use activities that help students see the value of the assignment and how it connects with their goals. And then uh, they can you know, work on it autonomously. And then those ongoing progress ch checks can help students. It, it provides them interim feedback in terms of success um, opportunities for success or interim opportunities to revise and say, okay, you know, I didn't quite get the goal this time on that assignment, but, uh, you know, the professor said, okay, you need to revise on these things. Okay, so now I'm going to keep, I'm going to revise, I'm going to keep progressing toward the goals. And that's going to keep the motivation um, high in that, in their determination that they can um, succeed. And some reflective questions that you might have them answer. Um, is this plan working for me? Whatever their plan, you know, whatever they're doing, you know, they have the self-determination. Is it working? Do I need to adjust? Do I need to adjust it to be more productive? Maybe I need to get some help. Um, there, sometimes when I was an undergrad, I used to do my homework outside of, uh, one of the laboratories where the TAs um, were in there. And I knew that if, if I had a question that I could just hop in there and um, get some help. But even just being outside there, even if I didn't have questions, I just felt like there was support and I was more calm when I was doing the, doing the homework and um, more successful. So it helped with my motivation. And um, have them think about do they understand the content or do they need, maybe they need to go back to the course materials or ask the TA or professor for another way to explain this concept that they're not getting. And then, um, so what um, techniques could, does anybody wanna share a technique that they used to increase uh, motivation in their class or? I know it's getting to um, I'm here, so um, I want to make sure that you um, know that the CIDL team is here to to help you, um, and we can expand on this uh, more if you would like. Just get a hold of me; I'm happy to do that. We have uh, consultations now. You can also set up appointments in the office uh, face-to-face. -face. So I want to thank you all for participating.